somewhere in those fish and wildlife minions. Otherwise, you, it's like a derailed car. That's no Ouch. joke. That's hurt. that's hurtful. <laughs> he'll, he'll he'll get to rambling, and it's like, where the f- did we even start? <laughs> <laughs> I already have to beep out the podcast, James. <laughs> Is it recorded right now? <laughs> I hit record already. Oh. oh, it's okay. We can beep it out. We can just edit that part out. Wait. No, that's no joke. I get to talking sometimes and I don't shut up. My wife is, James is my meeting wife up there in Olympia when I was, when we were up there in meetings and stuff. And James is like, cut it out. <laughs> Somebody's got to. So here we got a politician's son. Tracy, that's me. Yep. Well, you want to keep your last name quiet? For... Uh, no, I, it doesn't doesn't matter to me. All right. Well, um, he he wanted to go see what this cat hunting was, so he's been going with me. Um, he's new. James, you met him just just yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. How was your hunt today, Tracy? Uh, today was well. It was fun. Um, cold, windy, snowy. We just, we it let, wasn't that fun. No. <laughs> he's like, it's great. Every time you go with this guy, he's like, oh, man, well, this is tra- awesome. Traditional, traditionally, uh, if that's what you do, I'm sure today was a, a bust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I didn't go to my regular job, and uh, I had fun. So, John was the only smart one today. I don't know if that's smart. It's just what I had to do. Well, I can tell you at 7 o'clock, me and James were looking at each other like, should we... <laughs> Should we even go? <laughs> yeah, it rained all night long, and the wind was just, felt like that trailer was going to tip over there a couple times. The wind just hammered us all night. <laughs> it really did blow hard last night. Even when you live here, it was windy. I had that awning over my bed, and I, I mean, by 7 o'clock, I figured it was gone. I was like, I have, I've got to buy an awning for my trailer. I was about ready to already get on the internet and start finding a new awning, because I was like, that awning is gone. I haven't heard it in a little while. The wind stopped this morning, so I thought, Oh, that awning just blew off. We're not usually supposed to talk about the weather on this podcast, but when it does something like that all night long. That's a good point. I just <laughs> broke the podcast rule, talking about the weather. Your only rule. <laughs> so, so anyways, we got Tracy. How many times have you gone out, Tracy, with me? Let's see. Today would have been uh, six. Six times. Nice and easy. We just go catch a cat every time. Nah, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> no. First day, catastrophic failure. Oh, that's right. I even forgot about that. Yes. Did I tell you about the first day? Uh-uh. Oh, man. That was, we, uh, was that when the snowmobile broke down, blew up? Yeah. Oh, oh, that two catastrophic failures that day, actually. <laughs> Good. Yeah. My snowmobile, I was riding that snowmobile, and I'm like, wah, and then all of a sudden, I mean, just without warning, it's like you, you know, you're at a bicycle, and you stick a stick in the forks or the, the spokes. And the tire stopped spinning. That's what that track did. It like 25 miles an hour. Did you go over the handlebars? No. Luckily, it was deep snow. It just whoo, skidded to a stop. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, I was a ways away from the truck. Track just completely locked up. And I thought, the engine seized. I mean, I was like, Bleh. So I pull off the, the side panel there. I'm looking at the the clutch, you know. And and I push the button, and it, it cranks, and it moves. And I'm like, I was expecting it to be like, you know, when you hit a starter. In a truck, and it's like, <laughs> like completely bound up. I was that's what I was expecting, and it like cranked over a bunch, and it took about five seconds, and it fired. And I'm like, okay, we're pointing it down towards the truck. <laughs> Let's get out of here. We had stuff, <laughs> no shit. We had we had shit bungeed on like cover. I didn't put covers on the snowmobiles like nothing. Those was like, get this on there and let's get. If it's gonna give me a mile, I want to be a mile closer to the pickup when I gotta start walking. Walking out of here. Well, we had a broken trailer before that before that that's true so we had the trailer strapped on the back no not not when i broke i'd left the dogs right there on the side of the uh so i broke the tongue of that trailer Mm -hmm. i don't know how many times but this is one of many times i had i had that snowmobile trailer and it was made out of aluminum the tongue was and it cracked and snapped and so i was like crap so i parked the dogs on the side of the road and i'm like well let's just go find a track and we'll come back and I'll figure out how to get the dogs, and I'll just rode them into the track. Park the dogs, go a mile, and that's whenever I blew the snowmobile. So it was like, <laughs> I was like doubling down. Hmm. And about that time, I had my tail. I mean, because first time, I got a first time guy going with me. I'm trying to impress him. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, we'll just put the dogs here. We'll just keep going. <laughs> the second time, I was like, tail's tucked. I'm like, no, I'm going my truck. <laughs> Where's my truck? Somebody's trying to tell you something. <laughs> it sounds like, a, I mean, a really a pretty average day, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes for me. Oh, um, that's... Yeah, yeah, that's why we have this section called train wrecks. Yeah. So that was your first experience. That was that was day one. Yep. Day one. See, see, you got started right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was. You can't just go out and have an easy one right out of the gate. Nope. Mm-hmm. Nope. And then, uh, I think it was the very next day, we went to a new spot. Oh, in the, in the wheels. I, I I went to the coast. I got out of the snow and. Yes. You know, yeah. So we did that, and that was uh, a totally different situation than day one. Yeah. We were no longer, we had a a totally different mode of transportation, and uh, no snow. Which was nice. Right. I mean, it was different. Mm -hmm. So it was another change, another first for me. (laughs) Uh, Did you guys get one going that day? I don't think so. Um... No, I don't think we did. I think we had a couple strikes that day, but nothing nothing that produced anything. Yeah, nothing the dogs could move. That was uh and then and I don't know what what time did we finally get successful? How many times? How many was that five. five? Fifth. So the fifth time I finally caught him a cat. And that wasn't a clean race. Is that where they went and come back on their back track and went backwards a long ways. <laughs> mhm. I had to drive a long ways to pick up a dog that just like must have hurt us. I the only thing I can imagine is the dog hurt a snowmobile and just like hauled ass after Went the that snowmobile. direction. The wrong snowmobile. And I had to go chase it down. So So yeah, Tracy Hoff. Mm-hmm. And uh he's he uh you came out here into the season. We're kinda wrapping up our bobcat season over here and we're staying at John's house. And uh we went out today. I went out yesterday. And you guys weren't here yet. I did it by myself. I finally I got one. Nice Tom. Which I keep I keep telling you, John, I need to get a scale. You you're a, we gotta do that when we get done with this. You're a fishing guide and I figured you'd have a fish scale. <clears throat> I don't have one. But that way you could say what how, how are you a fisherman without a fishing scale? Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's <laughs> if you don't have a scale then you can make up your own deal. Right. The story <laughs> can be however big you want it to be. He's Tracy's got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have a scale it it it's it it changes your the, it gets the truthful story. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I like a the scale. Yeah, exactly. That's why they call it a scale. You go from a thirty five pound bobcat to an eighteen pound <laughs> bobcat yeah. when you have a scale. You, we were we were joking out there. Me and James were because I I show you the bobcat right, and you're like, oh yeah, they're like a fourteen pound bobcat. <laughs> well, I don't look at them anymore. I didn't mean that as a slam. I just <laughs> it hurt, John. I know. It totally I'm totally hurt. Sorry. I mean, I was like. Have you seen a 14-pound bobcat, John? Like that, <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> oh, man. I should have said 30. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then at least I would have been like, no, no. But no, and you used, you went you went way down. I, I, well, you know what? If if you have low expectations of yourself like I do, then you're not that disappointed most of the time. <laughs> exactly. So we went out this morning. We woke up. It was windy, and it was just miserable. It was I mean, nothing was moving. No chipmunks, no nothing. So that's where we're at. But we got a we got a game plan for tomorrow. Okay, so we do. We're gonna execute the game plan. I think we got the last couple of days of season, so we're gonna we're gonna do that. But I think tomorrow will be good for you guys, though. We hope so. I think it'll be a lot better than. I mean, you can't get any worse than today. No. No condition wise. No. <laughs> where we were gonna go is getting like. 28 to 36 inches of snow in the next two days so i'm like yeah i don't want to mess with that so so tracy yes sir we're we're gonna you're the new guy Mm -hmm. i want you to ask questions so you got we can make a joke about this but we got a politician son we got an indian (laughs) we got a cowboy cowboy and then we got a business you know i I sell hound supplies (laughs) We got the whole gamut here. We do, kind of. So, so you got you got a lot of experience here, and so I want you to ask questions. And and I, I know we got some topics we want to try and cover that are more, you know. I, I want to hit on some of the like the backtracking and the, the things we were just talking about over the dinner. But uh, I want you to first ask if you were to, if you were to start 
if for some reason you are foolish enough to want to get into this game, which I highly recommend is not exactly. <laughs> it's not your best option. No, this is like I would be. I would second that motion. Right <laughs> to me, there. this is like and, uh, and this is like boats. You know, I don't want one, but I like to know people that have a boat so I can use it. Yeah. So he's a lot smarter than James and <laughs> I and Buddy. Yes. You know? So you guys all have dogs, and I'll just ride in the truck and. Yeah. You know, and that's the smart way of doing it. For sure. Especially when the dogs are driving you nuts. <laughs> yeah. Which is mostly. Oh. It's definitely the cheapest way to do it. Yes. Yeah. So if you were if you weren't we weren't gonna be, you know, dumb yourself down a little bit and okay. be like, what have you learned from a new perspective? So so we've we've got a perspective, you know, of, of just having them. But perhaps somebody new, you've asked a lot of questions, and I don't know if you can remember all those questions that you've asked over the last six hunts of me showing you train wreck after train wreck. <laughs> I don't know if I can remember all the excuses I've given you because there've been a couple <laughs> excuses, but but uh, pretend you're asking those questions for somebody who might want to to learn something, you know. So we have got some topics we want to cover, but what's the first thing you got if you're if you were to even start? I want you to you know ask us some questions. Boy, I uh, I could ask. Well, why? <laughs> he starts with the hard question. That's, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. I didn't do my homework, John. Well, John, why don't you take that one? Because I, I totally so, don't well, know. So, wait, wait a second, though. Hold on. <laughs> so, being in the woods, right? That's why. <clears throat> that's why it would be for me. But why with dogs? Why with the hounds? You know, you've you've chosen a specific prey, in a sense. Yeah. You know, cats, mountain lions, bobcats. Even I mean, well, anything with hounds, bears, raccoons, whatever. But why, why the hounds? Why is that the choice instead of just walking around through the mountains with binoculars and chasing elk or deer? Yeah. So that's uh, like uh, everybody else. I guess that everybody will have their own thing, but I I think one of the things would be <clears throat> for some of the prey that we pursue, uh, trying to do it without our dogs would be like trying to, that this is a kind of a corny analogy, but it would be kind of like going fishing without a hook. Uh, a question to Buddy and James, uh, like in the, in the realm of mountain lions, how many of them have you seen in the daytime without your dogs in your entire life? Three, seven, two. Lucky. I've two. seen I've seen one mountain lion in ever in my life. So but, it would you be know what's funny is I haven't seen a single one since I got dogs. I, they were all before I had dogs, and they were just I couldn't have shot very many of them. Do you know what I mean? Make so it, that would be one. Uh, that would be one thing. It would be impossible to do what we do without them. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's lots of others. I'm sure. gonna let these guys go, but that would be one. Yeah, buddy. You know, I, I like. Believe it or not, I like a dog. Sometimes I wonder if I like a dog or not. But um, I'm the same way. I, uh, I like. I've and I've I've gotten better at it. So when I first started, um, it was just I wanted to do something with the dog, you know, and and now I like watching that dog grow and and just like like Andy would be a good example that dog i was like man i don't think it's gonna make it i don't think it's gonna make it and i was i, I was hoping to find a good home for it you know because she's a really sweet dog and it's been like a light switch that's just turned off and i'm like i almost can see the potential now that she's going to be pull a lot of weight you know and, and we're talking within three weeks you know what i mean like she is still so young but it's like i watched that light switch happen and what she's and doing two in the weeks race. Ago, i mean she or what was that was that two weeks ago yeah yeah, when, well, you you were yeah. with me when she she was cold trailing on that thing, and I was like, "Wow, that little pup is in there working hard." And it was like last year she was licking my boots on the road, and I'm like, "I hated the dog." <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so part of it's for me is is actually really getting to spend time with the dogs. And that yeah, that has a lot for me as well. And just I guess you get. You know, like Buddy said, you start out and you don't necessarily know what you're doing, and then it seems like you'll hit a point in time where 
at least for me, you know, years ago, you feel like, oh, I got really good dogs. I, this is a great pack of dogs. And as you keep going and progressing, you realize that, you know, those dogs you had 10 years ago that you thought were great dogs right. wouldn't even make it today with yeah. the dogs that you have. And so that watching that constant progression and, you know, trying to learn as much as you can along the way, definitely, I mean, I guess it's, some might even say it's almost like an addiction. You get to where it's, you just always want to see how much further you can let a dog reach its full potential. Well, I see it's definitely a di- an addiction if you saw the truck and trailer and setup that's <laughs> sitting outside. <laughs> There's a couple thousand yeah. dollars worth of equipment You out know there. that there is a few people in around here that have a problem. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh... I, and... The kennel that's also out there, too, for that matter. Yours. We'd, we'd definitely all have a lot more money if we didn't do what we did. That's that's for certain. Yeah, but I don't think we'd be as happy. No. No. For no. sure. That That's for sure. So you already hit on, I'll tell you another thing. I After doing it for decades, uh, I can honestly, buddy, you already hit on the one, so I won't dwell on that too much. But my two favorite parts of doing this are are being spending time in the country that these animals that we hunt call home, which you already hit on being out in the mountains Mm -hmm. and then taking a young dog, uh, that, that, you know, taking that little piece of modeling clay and taking it out and and seeing it develop and, and see that potential come out and that, that, that's actually my two favorite thing. I mean, in the line of work I'm in, I do need to kind of get some stuff done, but I, it, it's really cool to watch them progress. Okay, so hold all on, right. hold on, I got a question though. So I'm already I'm already sighted. I'm already taking over. Like I own the place. <laughs> so there's a really how big is that bull, John? Three seventy. That's a big bull. Like yes, we got three hundred and seventy inches. Really nice bull sitting above us. So I was wanting to ask, and I know my answer, but do you think and James, do you think the dogs have made you a better hunter without dogs? So you know, deer elk what has that done for you? Because I know for me, it has given me a confidence in the woods that translates into other game. Like I will. I agree with that. I I'm think... not afraid to jump down a, a canyon that maybe in the beginning I wouldn't have been as diehard, but I'm like, yeah, I've right. dogs made me go down that, that thing before. You know what I mean? Well, I think another part of that is you end up in places following your dogs that you wouldn't end up otherwise. And there's, you know, sometimes you'll stumble into a spot where, you know, you have a 370 inch bull elk and elk season rolls around and it's like, oh, well, I remember being down in there and, yeah, you know, seeing a big group of elk or deer or whatever it may be. Um, I think you end up in a lot of places you'd otherwise never see. And I think that that kind of translates into, you know, yeah. all forms of, of in, hunting. In the there. snow, in the, you know, just And you can learn tracks. a lot about, yeah, I mean, just the tracks that you stumble into as you're, you know, in the middle of a line race, you learn a lot about the other game in, in the area yeah. and how the animals are using the landscape. For sure. Yeah. Probably no one knows the country like we do, because like James said, the, the places that we, that our dogs take, or anyway, the places that we end up are places that many times most people would never go yeah, yeah. or haven't been <laughs> and i don't know that i want to go there again sometimes there's some places i don't want to go again i'll be honest with oh, you we like, all yeah. have those yeah yeah but you know what likely as not we'll all be back to those places yeah yeah the dog barks and we'll be like oh let's go down there again let's see what's down there all right so kind of <laughs> on that same thing is you get to be a better hunter you know in a sense you you've seen more places you're finding you know bigger trophies or whatever when you're with your dogs um is watching the dogs become better more important to you guys than actually taking you know a a prize cat of any sort oh for sure 100 right yeah so, it's all about the dogs the, right the, the the taken of the animal i think is secondary to almost all of us yeah Right. So when you're with your dogs, it's not about the trophy that they're after. It's about the dogs getting better. Whereas when you're hunting for that, an elk or or a giant mule deer, that is what it's your satisfaction. Exactly. Not the dogs. Yeah. 
I don't I don't think any of us would do it if it wasn't for that. No. No. I, I matter of fact, I what's I know I wouldn't. No. I I'm right there with you. Yeah. I I, I yeah. A hundred percent. And and with an elk or a deer, it's about going and getting the animal for me. You know what I mean? Like I I am there. To harvest an elk. I mean, that's that's what I'm there. And I enjoy, I wouldn't say a better hunter. Whenever you said, oh, it makes you a better hunter. I don't know that it makes me a better hunter. Maybe it does. I'm a slow better learner. Better might have been a, not the well, right I, word. Well, I just think it makes you a better woodsman. Right. You know yeah. Okay. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a better woodsman. Yeah. You learn how to traverse the land a lot. You know, there's places we got to go that you just can't go straight. You got to be like, oh, I got to go this ridge or coming down here. Um, you know, I know John deals with some bluffs and stuff, you know, and you just got to learn how to. You got to become better with the land and and the animals the same way. So. Just like the other day when we had that, we had to climb up that ice chute. <laughs> Dogs are like seventy five yards off the road. I mean, yeah. you could see them cross a creek and we the path a we frozen decide. creek, John. Like it looked so 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 we're down within ten yards. I go down there and it looks like this stream <laughs> and there's a rock. I'm like, I step on this rock. And I decided that I can just jump over to this like smooth patch of what I thought was how he didn't know snow. it was ice. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not used to this cold weather crap, man. And so I jump, and it's just like a skating rink ice. <laughs> and I'm like, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> he jumps off this rock, thinking he's gonna land on like soft ground, I guess, under the snow. And I'm watching this, like, what is he doing? <laughs> and he jumps and lands right on the frozen creek and just feet come out from underneath him. He piles up and he's like, don't jump. I'm like, yeah, I didn't plan on jumping. That wasn't, definitely wasn't my first thought. There's some, there's some definite differences between, you know, the North, uh, you know, so me being a woodsman is me being over. Uh, 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 you, but you won't do that again. Probably. I've learned. I, I have <laughs> flat snow mm -hmm. normally might mean water. It's probably I mean, could be slippery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Frozen water. So, um, but no, that that was a prime example. That was just a sheer rock, and we fought our way up there, past the dart gun back and forth like three times. Yeah, and uh, and on the way out, we found a much easier route out of there. Yeah. You won't forget that route, though. No, you won't. No. So, so that I think that wraps. You know, as far as the woodsman, the hunting. But I was just curious on on your take if if the dogs, because I know for me. It has made me a more dedicated outdoorsman for other, yeah. you know, like some of my, my hunting partners um, cringe when I'm like, we're going up to the top of that or we're going, you know what I mean? They're like, oh my God, they're going on a death hike with me. Yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, because none of us are going to abandon our furry friends out there. Right. So it makes us more dedicated, you know. You know, until we get to take them home, we're not going home. Yeah. Most yeah. people aren't like that. You know, and, and when Buddy said about, uh, I'll tell you a funny thing, like my wife hunts with me fairly often and we'll ride out some big ridge or whatever and I'll look off in a canyon and she goes, every time you do that, she goes, the difference between you and I is she goes, I know you want to know what's in the bottom of that. And she goes, and I am <laughs> praying that we don't go down there. So there's the difference, you yeah. know. I'm like, I can't wait to see what's down see there. And she's like, there. I can't wait to not be <laughs> down there. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of answers that question a little bit. Why? That is That, that answers why. Yeah. Yep. In, in the past, I think as a kid, at least for me, I didn't have dogs. And so I spent a lot of time four-wheeling up in the mountains because I wanted to be in the mountains right. and spend a lot of time in the mountains. But I didn't have a reason. If that makes sense for me, you know what I mean? Like I, and I, it's funny. I, I joke when I'm up in the mountains now in the snow, if those kids take those four wheelers and they go in the ditch and they go all over the place, they see a, a fresh powder, a snow that has no tire track in it. I'm like, I was hunting with Rod one time and, and he was just cussing those, those damn kids in their four wheelers. And, and now I'm that old man is like, those damn kids in the four wheelers. <laughs> like, can't you just keep it on the road? Just so straight. Yeah. Straight through. So. I think that would be pretty much my why is I want to be in the mountains as much as I can, you know, and then I'd probably, I, well, I'm not going to go get a whole bunch of dogs and start running them because my brain still works. Yeah. <laughs> but that would, if, you know, I see a bobcat or a cougar or something run across the road when I'm in the mountains and I'd think to myself, well, that's the way to get it. If I want that dogs is how it's going to happen. 
It makes you more successful. Right. If you, yeah, exactly. That would make me more successful. But I have you guys, so I don't need to have the dogs. <laughs> so James or John, so if he was to get a dog, how would you tell him to get started? So so pretend he was going to get started. What What's the best advice you got for somebody who's wanting to get into this? Well, I guess for starters, I would spend time around, you know, a different group of guys and, and figure out what you want in that dog and try to spend as much time hunting with somebody as you can that's going to hunt in similar conditions to you, um, you know, similar terrain and watch what works for them and and then kind of pick and choose from there as far as, you know, what you want in a dog, whether that be you want a dog that's going to chase bears, you want a dog that's, you know, going to grind old lion tracks out in the dirt. Um, but try to spend time with somebody that that hunts in similar conditions that you do and, and see what works for them, I think would be probably where I would start. Absolutely. That would be the way to do it. And, uh, and know that there's a, that's a long road. Yeah. Yeah. But I think getting, getting with somebody that, that knows like, you know, even just anything remotely similar. Um, I think that that, that right there gives you a jump start that you wouldn't have otherwise for sure and and you're gonna and it would depend on what you like if you came to james and said james i want to or buddy or me and said you know you if you had something in mind you wanted to learn how to do i just go on more for james that that in all walks of life there's people that <clears throat> seem to rise higher in that pile than others and i would definitely tell you to go try and attach yourself to people like that because your learning curve and in my life, I certainly can tell you that's happened, but your your learning curve is just, they just cut decades off yeah. of your learning. Uh, and, and and everything that we do, it, it, it's just the way it is, is a challenge. Uh, none, of, none of it's really easy. Uh, people like James and Buddy make it look easy most of the time. I mean, some, we all have tough days, but it, it's... It, the people that make it look easy, and then when you go start doing it on your own, you're like, "Wait a minute, yeah. this wasn't, uh, this didn't come with that. That manual didn't say <laughs> yeah. this, you know." Right. So yeah, I, I, but I, James is exactly right to attach yourself to someone that, uh, you know, that that treats their animals good and and you know has good values and stuff and and works hard at it, and then and then if it's in you, you'll go do it. Yeah, right. that's what I would say. So don't just go get a dog and. That's one way to do it. You yeah. can do that. I mean, and that's how we all did it. That's, <laughs> to be honest, I'm not saying that's the easiest path. Right, but nowadays, that's not what you would recommend. If you were going to start, I would tell you to probably not start like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's that's exactly what he asked. Yeah. Yes. And in the same token, some of that is what you got to do. Yeah. I mean, you, you right. Well, like, if you just got to take the chance. Well, it, try it. I think there's also retrospect on some of it is is at least for me i gotta learn myself too you can tell me all day long what not to do and for some reason i'm like well why not and then then i go in there and i'm like oh oh that that's why not you know so so i think there's some truth to learning on your own too so it's a it's a it's a catch-22 you know what i mean like there's you got to learn from people but at the same time at least for me, I had to experience it myself to really, because I'm not smart like that. I, I got to do it twice. Well, at some point, you're going to have to go apply what you learned. Yeah. Uh, but it, it would just, if you'd never done it and you wanted to learn how, it, just the, the basic, even getting the machine started part is what I think James and I, yeah. because I'll tell you what, uh, some things I've done in my life, like I've, rode in low flying aircraft a lot at work thousands of hours but i'm not a pilot right but i've spent a lot of time doing that but it doesn't make you a pilot uh hanging out with james or buddy or i very likely wouldn't make someone a hunter but at least they would get exposed to it and then as they went and did it we've all done it then you have questions you know hey uh boy this happened today and what do i do it's like well you know you might have tried this or that, but sometimes those things just happen. Yeah, and and those, you know, that that's probably the part for me that keeps it interesting is that is there's many facets to this game we play, and and no one has all the answers to them. 
uh, or at least nobody that I know. No. Yeah. I do think that that starting today versus, you know, even 15 years ago, getting into it, I, I think for somebody that's wanting to get into it today, it's a lot easier to learn parts of it, you know, with that having GPS technology and, you know, everything else. Um, it, it makes some aspects, I think, a lot easier, but I think you also lose a little bit of of knowledge that, you know, if you're sitting there glued to that GPS, um, yeah. you might not learn as much as some of these guys that you can spend time with that, that hunted without that stuff. So that's a really good segue into this second part was what do you hear in the race? So in the race that, so I guess describe the, the couple races that you've been on. What have the dogs told you versus the GPS? Cause because you're you got you're a blank slate, so we're just going to use that as we get to hear the dogs, and so a lot of times, like we know what's going on when when we caught that cat that you know yeah I mean I knew that cat was right there yes and and just by the way my dogs were acting I was like this is serious and I, I heard them locate and I was actually looking for a track because that cat made a little loop and I was on this you know the dogs didn't make the loop that you know that the cat did because they must have you know been screaming. I mean, as soon as I heard a dog, I was like, oh, they got it right there. You know, so I didn't, I didn't have my GPS. I was looking for a track. I was trying to figure out, do we got two cats? I mean, it was just, I was like trying to figure out what the heck was going on in that situation. So I was looking at the, the ground, but I could, uh, I could just tell by one bark. I was like, whoa, but they got it right there. They, that, that cat's up, you know, but were you able to know that? How long did it take you to realize that it was treat or did I just say it right away? Uh, no, I think. Well, the GPS thing, I, I played around with it since you handed me one uh, to make sure I didn't get lost. Uh, I'm not smart enough to use it, and I, I can follow the the colored lines that correspond with the dog's colors on there, and I can see kind of like which direction they're going. But when they're barking, that was always interesting to me to watch you, buddy, know which dog is making those barks. You know, you learn. And you can learn the tone of of each dog's bark, what they're, you know. I remember you telling me you could hear, I don't know, maybe it was Della or Andy, whoever it was, barking, and you said, she's frustrated. Right. Her that bark means she's she knows there's something here, but she can't figure out where. She's frustrated, you know. And uh, that was interesting because, you know, I, I just hear howls and barks and, <laughs> and everything you know and i started after you know four times going out i could start telling which dog was make the barking i don't know what they mean but i could tell there's different dogs out there but when they got really excited you can tell it's it just seemed like well they got excited they get louder and their barks become a lot more frequent and it's, it's just it just kind of gets rowdy and out of control. Well, then they're excited. Then I get excited. Then you're yelling. There's there's one over here. So everybody's just kind of excited. So I don't know if I could really even tell by really? the tones that something was in the tree right there. But I did hear the difference from frustration to, you know, uh, even the dogs talking to each other. Like, come this way. We're right. we're following this way. Or, uh, yeah, I'm I'm lost. The dogs are lost. Or, you know. So the tones thing was was new to me, for sure. John, how many dogs? How many dogs? You, what do you have? Oh, uh, so I have for our listeners, twenty-seven. Okay, but then how many dogs do you take out? Uh, sometimes I take twenty, but I very seldom take less than a dozen. Uh, but and I can tell you. That when I go with John, I'm like, how do you know the difference between your do- like 20 yeah. dogs? But you can tell the difference between your dogs. Oh, sure. Every dog, you know what? We're all sitting here visiting, and it's really not any different than this. Buddy's voice is different than mine. Right. James's voice is different than yours. And when you do it all the time like we do, uh, that's, you know, you're probably pretty perceptive to, you know, you used a, you used a word just a minute ago, and you said you could tell those dogs were excited. And, you know, I've taken over the decades. I've taken a few people with me, and a lot of people are like, "Well, it just sounds like a bunch of barking to me." And to us, you know, that's a that, that's that's to us is is like reading a book. 
uh, yeah. or, 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 or hearing a story, you know, they're painting us a picture with war, with noise is what they're doing. And that excitement like, that you, you picked up on that pretty fast. Yeah. And uh, yeah. definitely, you know, when the dogs, and I know you've heard all those terms, you know, dogs, you know, if they're trailing on a real tough line track in the dirt or something, they're, they're grubbing, working really hard and stuff. But is that track what we would call warm up or heat up, you know, where they're getting closer to it or the conditions get better or whatever? you can hear the difference in their deal. And, and it's funny. I mean, we all have lots of dogs and stuff, but you know, I have dogs that are really good dogs that they'll start a really old lion track. And I have some of them that are, that are actually really good strike dogs, which means they can detect a real faint smell and, and tell you when they find it. And they might trail a track like that a quarter of a mile and I'll be riding a horseback or a mule back behind them. And they'll walk back to me and look at me and like, dude, we're never catching this thing. <laughs> but we'll and, get... and you know what? They're almost always right. But those other dogs, but sometimes they're not. But I'll tell you that, that it, it takes all different, uh, I guess it takes all different kinds of positions on a team. I'm not much of a sports guy uh, to do, to make a team. And our dogs are kind of the same. There's dogs that, but every once in a while you get a really special one that can do all the jobs really good, which is really cool. Uh, and we all look for that, but just like us, uh, you know, they're not perfect. Uh, right. And yeah. so anyway, but so, so John, what, um, when he said frustrated and I know how I could tell that dog was frustrated. Do you, how would you tell somebody on your dog's like an old track that you're not going to catch. What what are some of the telltale signs that you look for when you're like, oh man, that's old, or or that's a that's a that's a good smell. You know what 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 cues do you do you key in on? You know, I guess a, and James can chime right into this, but like you have dogs that that are uh, you know that an old 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 smell maybe doesn't excite them as much, or they. They literally, they can smell it and they'll put tail on it and stuff. And they, I mean, they know the thing's been there, but, but there are some dogs that just literally, you know, that you ride through the country, a horseback and, or a mule back. And I mean, if, if they even think a lion's been in that country, I mean, they literally, they will, they will scour that whole mountain to find that one little bit of smell. And, uh, I kind of akin, I don't know about you guys. This is a question actually, I guess for Buddy and James, but. I kind of compare tracks that we trail, whether it be, I, I just kind of hunt lions, but uh, to like a dot to dot game. And, and the more dots you erase, the harder they are to hook together. And at some point, no matter for what hunter or what pack of dogs, y- you won't put those dots together enough to catch it, but you might get far enough ahead that day that the next day, it's a very much a thinking person's deal. Yeah. And I don't know what you got, but anyway, back to Buddy's deal. But uh, I think two things about tracks, like sometimes a track is tough. And here's an interesting thing. I've had dogs over the years that are are really super good dogs. And they are like what I told you, like an old smell that they could barely trail that they, they wouldn't, you know, they, they, they'd strike it and they'd trail it for half a mile. And then they'd almost want to like quit it because they're like, dude, we're not going to catch it. But you could take that same dog. This is one of the things that I think I like the most about doing what we do is that you could take that, this particular dog I'm thinking about. His name was Sam, and I, he died at 15. And that dog, if, if you started a track in horrible conditions, but that was a catchable track, that dog would never quit that. He knew the difference. So yeah. that, that's it. And that's just all of us, as you already figured out, is kind of a, I'm not going to say it's an addiction. I'm going to say it's an obsession. I, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's a nicer word. That is a uh, nicer word. But I don't know if it's really any different, but it, oh, I'm going to say that. So, and these guys, yeah. but anyway, uh, that, and, and I think that's, again, just people like us that spend a, a big part of their lives with those dogs, uh, using them for what they were born and bred to do uh, as a handler and, and part of that hunting pack. You learn, you know, what, those different dogs are telling you different things. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out like we want it to. No. For any, or at least not for me. And one key point was, is you were with me whenever Andy started opening up on a track, my puppy, my, my year and a half old puppy. But, and I was like, it was just so odd to me that I was like, that was a new sound in my pack that for me, it was like, I thought it was a coyote. I mean, I was like, 
she's squealing. She's got an ugly voice. It's like, <laughs> man, but she was up there working. I could see on the GPS and I, and I could see that she was, you know, so that was something you experienced on me that was like, and I was just taken back. I was like, what is that? Yep. I remember that. And it was that. so weird for me. Now, she, now she's, she's like, talks to me. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think that's weird anymore, but that was that first voice, you know, when those, when those young dogs open up, you never know what kind of voice it's going to be, whether it's going to be chop mouth or a ball mouth or, you know what I mean? They got all these different types of way of, of barking. And hers was, was one that I was like, okay, well. That's what I got, a squealy old <laughs> ugly voice in my pack. So we're going to add some of that to it. James, uh, how do you know a, a age or track with voice or what? I mean, what, what keys do you look for? I think it's <clears throat> a combination of voice and, and body language of that dog. And kind of like John had said, there's times where, you know, they can, they can barely pick it up, but that dog's not going to quit. And they might, you know, they might start looping out two, three, four hundred yards trying to figure out where the cat went, where yeah. the track's at. And you have those other times where they pick it up, they'll open, you know, move a little bit, and, and it's that's just kind of the end of it. And I don't know, I guess I don't know what it is about, you know, say you take a track of the same age and, you know, one day they can they can pick it up and they're not going to quit it, and one day they, you know, they'll take it yeah. a couple hundred yards and that's it. But... I think you can kind of watch the body language of that dog and you can watch, I guess, the the drive for that track. And it seems like that changes. Um, yeah. One of the, the keys, and I, I wasn't perceptive enough to pick this up, but Don, Don Gilbert, he was telling me that in his dogs, the longer the bark, the colder the track. And that's why I was wondering if you guys have noticed that. And, and I have seen that, that my dogs will have a... Sh the, when they start getting jumped, it's everything starts shortening up, and and maybe it's because they're breathing more. I don't know, but I was just curious if you guys have noticed that. Well, like Mabel, I mean, if it's a if it's an old old track, she's got just a long drawn out ball mouth. I mean, and it's like a frustrated bark, I guess. Yeah, that's and I think that's where you said frustrated, yeah, because I remember you saying the longer long, the bark, yeah. the colder the track, and we heard a bunch of that, and you, I remember you saying. They're frustrated. Yeah. Yeah, and you listen to her on that versus, I mean, you've seen her at a tree. It's it's every yeah. single breath. Yep. Um, and on on a colder, older track, she's longer. You wouldn't even think it's the same dog. Um, yeah. Listening to it. Question for you, James. Do you, when you said your dogs, you know, work on that track, do you think that's, do you think that's conditions, or do you pull think your, pull your mic up a little bit? There you go. Do you think that's conditions? Or or do you think it's condition of the dog, like if you've been hunting so hard that they're tired, or do you think it's both? I think it's both. Um, you know, if you have that that real stable conditions, it seems like, like, you know, take a track that's four days old, but you've had just real stable weather, no wind, it stayed, you know, within a five, six degree temperature range, um, and you have fresh dogs, I feel like you can move that track a lot further than you know, if you don't have that, those stable conditions and you take those dogs in there after they've been run hard for a week, um, you know, a fresh set of legs goes a long ways. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Not too fresh. Yeah. Not too fresh. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, 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 cause I, I, you know, we talked last night when we all got a visit, but I, I think conditions are everything, you know, there, there are times that baffle me still about things that, that these canines that help us in our everyday life can do. And then other times, you know, the, there's things that we think they ought to be able to do, but, it, and they can't. And, and I think we'll never, I think that's, I think that's why this is so interesting. Cause those things happen enough that you're like, well, why, you know, why could you not do that? And, 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 you know, none of us keep dog, you know, that's probably Tracy part of this is that those really, really special dogs, which we all will be lucky in our life to have a handful of those. And they just, you know, some of them just don't have an off switch. They no. just literally don't know how to stop. They, they, they're, they're like, it's kind of funny. They like, they look at other dogs when it's hot outside and they're shading up and stuff. And they're like, well, you bunch of losers. I can't <laughs> believe that you're even slowing down. And some of them would shock me. <laughs> they're like, Hey, get in the Let's truck. Go. We're going. Oh yeah. 
absolutely. <laughs> they don't, they, they're like, I came to hunt, not go home, yeah. you know? So. Yep. So, uh, the conditions, so that, that segues into another conditions. I want you to, mm-hmm. so what have you seen? Cause you've been in some really crappy conditions. I have. So tell me what, what about conditions that you've learned? The conditions make the hunt essentially. Yeah. Uh, I had a bunch of questions about that when we first started, when we first went, uh, the, the, the tracks in the dirt, which John, that's seems kind of like your forte with, with the lions and stuff. Uh, that seems, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we can't see, well, I can't cause I'm not conditioned to that, I suppose, but I, I don't see tracks in the dirt. I barely see tracks in the snow that are, I mean, have been there for 10 minutes. We, you uh, know, and just we, a short story with him. I, we were, we were, we were, we're hauling out the snowmobile. Oh, jeez, I know where this is going. I <laughs> and think. I see a track, and I hit the brake, and I, and I, uh, and I'm like, hey, check that track. And I know damn good and well it's Bobcat, 100. percent I mean, I, I seen it. I was 25 miles it an is. hour, just like. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm picking on you. Okay. Is, Go ahead. No, nothing sacred here. We'll, we'll throw anybody under the bus. All right. <laughs> and so I, uh, you know, I, I was just checking him. I was like a dog. You know, I was checking him like a dog. I was like, hey, check that track for me. You know? And he goes in there and he goes, I think it's a coyote. <laughs> I did. I did say that. And uh, That's just, an easy like, mistake, though, when you're first starting out. That's, I've, I've, I have oh, turned, yeah. you, you know how many coyotes I've turned loose on, Tracy? Just so you know. <laughs> well, Man. I also later on, I, I said, I think I stopped and I, I got off and I said, "Where? Let me let me show you what this this track is here. I'll mm-hmm. tell you what this one is." And I was wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while to to learn that. Oh, you know, uh, that's uh, it. It's but it's always fun to learn. It is, yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, d- you got to remember that people like us with our obsession. I'm going to use that word now. That's my word. I'm going to tell my wife that I'm just obsessed. <laughs> uh, is uh you know we all do that so much and we and we're act and you said that about looking at it and it is true but you know <clears throat> after you do it a long time and you know how to look for tracks and where to look for them and what that looks like like when i take a, a lot of dogs with me and like say they say when it's not frozen and stuff and they trail a, a track up a like a wash or a big the bottom of a big canyon and uh, i've lots of times had a rancher or someone with me and and I'll ride along and I can have you know 20 dogs have went up that canyon and I can look in the middle of that and and see that lion's track real easy and I'll say that to someone they're like oh is this a lion track and I won't even look at it and I'll be like that's a dog and they're like (laughs) well thanks a lot that hurt my feelings and I'm like well I'm just telling you and they're like well how can you tell and I and it's just like Tracy I don't even know what you do for a living but if I went to do that with you I would be way behind the curve Sure. And, and it's the same thing as going with us. When yeah. you spend every day doing that, it's not fair. You know, like it's it's not fair because yeah. that's kind of what we do. And they definitely, I, I would tell you, cat tracks that you know, I mean, snow or dirt, or whatever. But they're always smooth. Yeah. You know, they don't even even you know, it's crazy. Like even when a cat kind of is trotting or even running, you know, they don't disrupt a lot of things. When you watch the way they put their feet and stuff, it is, uh, we were watching a video the other night and, and, uh, the remark I made, and I've got to been blessed to see lots of them in my lifetime, you know, and stuff. But when they move, it always reminds me of smoke. It's just like, doesn't it kind of, you? Yeah. It's, it's like fluid. It's not, it, when they move, it's completely different than anything else like we see lots of deer and elk and coyotes and stuff but when you see and and mostly like you said that's what i do but a but a bobcat too the little bit that i've hunted but when a cat moves it's it is so different than other animals i think and once you get that i guess once you get the eye for it you know like buddy said there's you could be going down the highway at 45 50 miles an hour in good conditions and oh there's you know that was a line track yes oh yeah I've, i've seen that yeah. since i've been around yeah, we joke about that the little bit that snow out like if we have a good brand new snow i call that 40 mile an hour snow because you can go so fast you know and <laughs> yeah you're not gonna miss very many if they you know if they do that yeah yeah um, and i think that was kind of, it was a really good explanation i it's it's a clean track it's the best thing i can i can explain is like half the time i'm not looking for the print I'm looking how it walks through the, the cadence. Yeah. yeah. How the yes. cadence. And you right. can even look at that through the middle. I just had this the other day where 
turn loose on a, a pretty old track and I had dogs going in the beginning two separate directions and I was trying to figure out I in my head I knew who was right but I was checking to make yeah. sure that what I thought was going on was actually going on and I had a buddy with me that he doesn't get to go very often he doesn't have dogs but he, he enjoys to go um but just not a ton of experience and so I I'm down following the dogs down to where they split and on snowshoes and it's thick brushy not enjoyable to walk in and uh he hollers he's like oh I, I got the track right over here i got the track right over here and i'm like in my head i'm thinking well maybe the dogs i thought were wrong are actually right and so i tromp over there and it's not an enjoyable trek to get to where he's at and instantly <laughs> i look at him like no it's dogs that's, yeah. that, that's no, there's no lion there and walk back to where i thought it was at and it was there but um you know even in the middle of that dog tracked up mess you do it enough and you get to where you can look right through all of that and and see that lion track yeah for sure yeah because they just look different yeah and they travel like if you learn where they where they walk and how they walk and and you know. i've i've picked up on some of, of the the traveling uh you know motions of of different critters since i've gone with you you know yeah a coyote wouldn't cross a log you know, walk walk across a, a fallen a yeah. fallen log. You know, and if we see tracks there, even if they're old, it probably was yeah, a coyote think, or a deer. I think I see. I was like looking down in a draw, and it was like twenty yards off, and I see this track way down this little draw. You know, I can't look at it. But I'm like, that's a cat. <laughs> like there, there was a cat right there. I, um. So yeah, like it, it is. But like I think John said the best experience. It you know so. Um. But that's interesting. I was. I'm glad we hit that topic. But back to conditions. Yeah. Uh yeah, the conditions make everything um that I've that I've noticed w from rain uh actually there's a lot of stuff I learned about the conditions that I I wouldn't have even really thought about uh the way smell transfers, you know, from a track to the air whether it's frozen, which I kind of didn't that's not something that I don't know if everybody thinks that way, but I didn't. So James, let, let's talk about frozen tracks because James probably got some good experience on on frozen. Because frozen, I read, yeah. There's and especially as we get later into the spring and you get that, you know, it warms up during the day. There's not much snow left, but warms up, snow gets soft. You know, cats travel before it freezes overnight, and then the next morning you're in there and everything's just frozen rock solid. Um, you know, at that point depending on how frozen it is it's like similar to running something down the asphalt there's but what i've i guess something that i've learned and whether or not it's just been by luck or not but i've gone into places um and and tried to run a frozen track have the dogs you know you had, somebody, turn up. you had somebody trying to tell you to run a frozen track <laughs> <Yeah>. before kind of kind of turn up a little bit and not really be able to take it and I've given that track three or four hours, let the sun come out and that let that snow soften up. And the sand rises up. And it. and you can go back and run that frozen track better at noon than you can run it at six in the morning. Um, in my experience, I guess. Absolutely. So something about that's why when I was asking James about conditions and he said he already touched on it, but I tell you, no matter what the condition is, it, it, it for me whatever medium that that track was laid in, whether it would be dirt or snow or whatever, you want conditions to not change. Constant conditions make for better trailing. And it's really interesting, like what James, a lot of people make a a bigger deal than it is to go catch a lion like in the summertime when it's hot and dry outside. Uh, there are some challenges to that, mostly about keeping your dogs in real good shape and stuff. But when it's dry and it's consistent, that's actually easier than what he was talking about when it's 50 in the daytime and 18 at night. That is tougher than catching one for me. I'd rather go hunt in August than when it's like that. Yeah, for sure. Myself. Well, that's one of the conditions that I've seen with with both of these two, James and Buddy, is is the drip. Oh, uh, when, when it's cold in the morning, you get there, you're on something. And then next thing you know, it's, it's 11, 12 in the afternoon and it's warming up and everything's coming out of the trees. Now you have 
brand new wet slimy snow everywhere and everything's covered and there's no more smell yeah and that that slows you down a lot i mean you get to where they get in under those trees and you can listen to it i mean without even watching it where they get into that drip and it gets quiet and they're grinding 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 and they might hit a spot in an opening where that cat had crossed and you know there's there's no trees right above it and they'll pick that track up there and they'll go another 10 feet and it's vanished and if you can usually if you can get work through that drip to a point where that track is warm enough and they're getting close enough you you have pretty good odds of catching it if they can work it through that drip i feel like and come out on the other side of it to where it's you know whether you get on the other side of the ridge and it's colder or whatever um and my experience i guess if you can get a dog to work through that drip and get up to the point where they're out of it you have pretty good luck at catching that cat yeah um but yeah that the drip is just terrible i mean it, or you just keep hammering it till the afternoon and it starts cooling back down yeah. and things start helping again so one of my mentors uh when i first started this a long time ago had told me said you know the only two things that keeps you catching from catching a lion is time and distance yep and and when you dissect it down to its smallest degree i don't know about you guys but that i mean let's face it it, it, even no matter what the conditions were if the thing was 50 yards from you you'd probably catch it yeah might get away but probably not but the farther that 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 lion travels and the more time goes by the harder it's going to be to hook those dots together and get it done. Uh, so constant conditions certainly make that easier, but but time and distance is is what stops you from being successful uh, in my endeavor most of the time. Yeah, and I had, I guess, you know, there was a point in time where, and I remember this, we trailed this bobcat, um, just a really long ways and dogs were having a tough time with it and we'd gone down through some sagebrush country and kind of all over the place and we were on foot and i mean we're miles into this thing and i'm starting to get frustrated and uh the guy i was with because i'm like you know how far did this thing go and he turns and looks at me he goes well all they have to do is walk around that's all they got to do all day is just walk around and so it's like <laughs> you start thinking about it like that and then you know it's all, that's their only job is to walk around and eat and so and by golly sometimes they they do a lot of walking yeah they uh the uh, my other favorite one of that is like well i've told this to people that have been a little saddle sore with me on a, several different occasions and they're like man how far did this thing go and i go well he's standing in the last four tracks he made that's all i can tell you <laughs> yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah well yeah the conditions uh i saw a bobcat and the dogs were I mean, a hundred yards, less than a hundred yards behind it, and couldn't couldn't smell it. Yeah, in the drip, they were working the it, but it was they could not. It was it was a it was a crap. And I, at that point, it was late. I pulled. They'd been working on it for two hours. Right. I was like, we. But on the flip side, if I pulled them, I was never going to catch it. You know, like I I we had to pull them so we can get back to the truck and all that. Absolutely. But half of me, part of me, was like. Just let them keep going. I mean, it, 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 the odds of catching it weren't very good if I let them keep going, but they were worse if I, when I pulled them, I, like at the point where I pulled them, I was like, I would, I would like to, you know, cause sometimes, and I don't know if you guys ever done this, but you're like, there's no way. And all of a sudden, like a light switch, it changed. Maybe it went in a different area. It got out of the area that had the drip or, you know, went into an area that had different trees or different cover or something or the or the temperature started coming back down you know um you just never know that's the, that's the the beauty of it is you just sometimes you just never know you well have and that to cat call. could be laid up right on the other side of that ridge <clears throat> you know you might be having and i've i've had that a lot where you go from barely moving that track to a jumped race i mean just yeah. that fast and so that's where i and sometimes i think i probably push those tracks maybe further than i should you know you get get to the point where you're out there on snowshoes you know covering just as much ground as those dogs are yourself trying to find that track um and then get far enough away from a road or anything else and it's like why am i even out here why did (laughs) did i do this but for me it's that you know 
you never know it that lion could be laid up just right on the other side of that hill and you know after you have a few of those where you feel like there's no way you're going to catch it and then you know next thing you know you're caught yeah. um it's just always in the back of your mind to you know he he very well could just be right over the top of this hill the next corner it's always the next corner you get to that next corner and sometimes next, it's like well he's got to be he's, yeah. he's got to be laid up over here He'll be right there right there and that's probably some of what just keeps us going so hard is you see that and you just you just let them you you get and i think there's two maybe two different types of hunters but there's definitely hunters that once they start doing that I mean, I know the first time with hunt with Don, it was like, oh my God, he won't leave this thing alone. It's like even in the beginning, I was just like, let's go find another cat. There's got to be there's there's another cat somewhere. And Don kind of taught me, you know, how to just stay on that thing. And and the truth was, is he was successful at catching, and and the, his dogs got better. And and that's just it. You'll never have, you know, if all you ever do is run the easy tracks, yeah. fresh hot easy tracks you're only going to ever have dogs that are able to catch fresh, hot, easy yeah. tracks. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I guess in my opinion, yeah, that's, I, I would agree with that hundred percent. Do you guys ever, uh, like John, do you, uh, so like in that situation, you know, I, I knew a while before we pulled the dogs off that we weren't going to catch that cat about the time I got down there and they turned, I thought, okay, here, here we go. We're going to about ready to jump and catch it. And then when it, when I listened to those dogs, fizzle out i was like oh no they still can't move it and i still let them go another hour and a half you know just because for me I mean, what else are they going to be in the box you know i drive you know I, I was like well they're still learning they're still working you know and, right and the the dedication do you do you ever let them keep working when you know you're oh, not gonna catch it oh yeah i i you've hunted with me enough you kind of yeah. know how that i i'm i i'd say my pack of dogs and me are all pretty persistent about and what james said about that a lot of what i do you know we we will cold trail those things for hours you know and 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 people that aren't accustomed to that that you can tell that they you know when you when you go 15 or 20 miles in rough country a horseback after one of those things people are like man you know they're you know at this time of day this time of year they're like we're a long ways from our truck and i'm like i'm like that literally doesn't enter my mind. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I came here to do a specific thing. Right. And if those dogs aren't going to quit, then I'm not going to quit. And, and then we kind of talked about that already, but yeah, I, but sometimes, you know, the time that I do, and I, we've talked about this, but the time that you have to be careful that I have to be careful is when it's real hot outside, you have to be the one to stop them. Cause I have dogs that will hunt till they die. And so we got to be the ones to keep them safe. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it seems like if you, you know, if you end up, in my experience at least, if you ever let that dog get to the point where you do heat stroke a dog, um, it seems like you don't ever have that same dog back that you had beforehand. True story. Um, you know, whether it's after that point they overheat easier or whatever it is, it seems like if you get, if you work a dog to that point of exhaustion, you don't ever have the same dog that you had before that happened. Right, and so it's our job to, to and, and the problem is in a lot of this country where I hunt, there's not a lot of water. And uh, so, and, and we all know the country where we work and hunt good, but, you know, sometimes you'll be two or three miles from them getting a drink. And so you've got to be, that. that's probably the thing that, you know, it's like, those things are, kind, they're not kind of, those are my family, so I'm not going to let them kill themselves, you know. Uh, and so lots, many times you'll have to stop them and, and, and some of them aren't very thrilled about that. Yeah. You know, they you'd like, you know, the technology, I'll tell you, uh, James already hit on this, but like from when we all started till now, uh, the technology that is available to, to handle our dogs and stuff, we can keep them a lot safer, uh, whether it's from that, you know, having to get them to water or, I've had to stop my dogs from trailing into a highway where I know they got hit by a car, uh, or, or or things like that. Or like James has to deal with wolves all the time. Uh, I think as hunters and dog owners, that that's one of the biggest things that that helps us with. Is it? It it probably doesn't really. I don't know about you guys, but I don't I don't really think it helps you catch that much more stuff. It just helps you. It, it, it for me the way I hunt it just it keeps them safer and it and it keeps me 
It from, removes a lot of the stress, I feel yes, like. Yes, that, that's, that's exactly right. It makes it easier, makes it a little easier on your heart when they're, you know, when you're out there and there's hazards for them and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know. The anxiety level. Well, and you, you know, you don't ever have to, and I don't, I'm sure you guys at some point in time have, have had to leave a dog overnight in the woods, um, you know, back in the days of just telemetry and you couldn't get to them, couldn't find them, you know, whatever it may be. And now when you're running an alpha and you know exactly where that dog was, or even if the collar bl- breaks, you know exactly where he was before the collar broke. Um, at least for me, the days of ever having to leave a dog out overnight, um, that I just, you just don't have that anymore. And like you said, the wolves, I mean, now it's not even really an option. You know, the, the leaving right. dog out overnight is not even really an option in, yeah. in most of the country that I'm hunting in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you just hate to do it. You yeah. know, I, I mean, I mean, we've all had to do it, but it's sure something it, it's certainly with the advent of that and having buddy to help learn how to operate that stuff. It certainly doesn't happen very much anymore. Right. I've, uh, I've heard stories from my dad and, and other, you know, friends of, of running hounds back in the day. Uh, and it was just a bell on a collar and you just let them go and follow a bell and barks. And you just, if they don't come back, you look for them until you can't look for them. And then you go back the next day and look for them until you can't look for them. And then you hope they come back or they don't. Sometimes, unfortunately, uh, one memory that I have as a kid is my dad and I found somebody's hound in the middle of nowhere. And he was alive on the road. So we picked him up and took him back into town, had a collar, you know, with his name on it. So we called the dude and he was ecstatic to have his dog back, but he had been out for three or four days, the dog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're leaving sweatshirts on the side of the road and shoveling <laughs> straw on the side of the road and anything that smells familiar to that dog, you know, it, it's having that technology today is it, it's a huge stress relief and in a lot of ways, at least for me. Oh, yeah. every, I, everybody I know, you know. Yeah uh makes it safer for you you know if your dogs are caught somewhere and you can look at that topo map you know which part of the world you can go through to get to them yeah instead of going and getting to a big cliff that you can't get you know you, you know you need to go around you know some i there that i can't say enough about that yeah. that's a that's a big deal all right you, any more questions we got i want to touch on some of those topics while we got everybody here because this is really good um backtracking i heard you guys talking earlier about backtracking um john i want you first you tell me what you were you were saying about back a dog taking a backtrack and what you so again the uh, i'll i'll talk about it but it's going to be a question to you guys as much as a deal but uh in in my experience and the experience of, of some of the folks that i've been around a lot that have a worlds of experience doing this that uh, uh i've never seen a dog that wouldn't take a lion track backwards uh and what i mean by that is if if we were to ride like say we rode south from right here mm-hmm. and uh we were riding south and a lion had come down this canyon over here going north and and my dogs and i ride into that track head on i and that's why i was asking james but my dogs are going to trail that the way they're pointed yeah. uh I and 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 I don't have them turn themselves around. If you teed into a real fresh track, I, I we were kind of talking about this. this things that people hunters talk about. I think uh, if you're having a good week and everything's good and stuff, you know, I think over half the time or sixty percent of me, I don't know, I wouldn't give it a percentage, but that they should go the right way. But I'll tell you, as tracks age and stuff. Uh, I can tell you a couple of things. I have seen, I have hit lion tracks and trailed them backwards for quite a distance and finally found a track or a scratch or whatever and got the dogs caught and turned them around and go right back to where we've started that and they can't trail it an inch forwards. Yeah, I've had that, that exact same thing. So James, so what do you, what do you think that is? I, you know, we talked about this a little bit last night and whether it's, you know, similar to trailing into a kill versus trailing out of that kill um and how a lot of times you can trail into that kill a lot easier than they can leave it um and you know in your mind that trailing out should be the fresher side of that they you know should be able to move that 
easier that direction. But whatever it is, I mean, there's times where getting it trailed out of that kill is a lot tougher than it was to get it there. Um, and I don't, whether it's conditions or, you know, I, I don't know what that is, but, um, it's something you see fairly often. Like you say, they can start one backwards and take it all day long and, you know, not like they're moving it real hard and fast, but they're able to move it. And like you say, go right back to that same spot. And for whatever reason, the spot, you know, and, and I've had them still want to go back, you know, they're trying to go forwards and they, they just keep looking back. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is that causes that, but. And, and, you know, we can't see what they smell. Uh, but I know, you know, when you, you know, when you're seeing a track, and you're seeing if it's a tom land and you're seeing a scratch and stuff and you know that's the direction you need to go and and i used to in my younger days get you know pretty frustrated and irritated about things like that now it's like you know they're they're not doing that on purpose they're 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 doing what they can do yeah. uh, and it's our job as their owner is their you know we all a lot of my friends and i from down in the southwest joke about that but uh, the the guy that's sitting on the horse of the mule is supposed to be the brains of the pack, and I don't. That's using that pretty loosely, as you already know. But uh, you know, sometimes they just the, it, it's conditions or it's whatever it is. But yeah, they it. You know, uh, I've never. But anyway, I've never owned a dog that has a trail lion backwards. And we talked about this, but sometimes if you trail into where a lion has done a lot of milling around, or if they'd made a kill or something. Uh, James and I were talking about that just before we started this and how hard that can be to line that out. There's just this, you know, it's, it's like you look and look and look and you can't find a lion track and now there's a million of them. Yeah. And it's like, and, and I, and like James said, sometimes I don't let him talk about that, but sometimes maybe you can get out far enough to get out of that mess. Yeah. Get, get looped far enough out of that mess to where you can maybe possibly find a track that's going the right way. And, and I usually, like we talked about, I mean, you get down into that and if you can get to the dogs and you got dogs going three different directions, um, like we had said, you know, I, I don't usually get too hard on them at that, at that point at all. Cause they're, they're still smelling a cat. I mean, you know, they're still doing their job and they're still smelling a cat, but until I can physically get down in there and see, you know, which way is actually the right way, um, you know, I'm never going to get after a dog for doing its job but you do have a tough time with that especially you know in in some of that terrain you just can't get out far enough away from it to figure out which way it's really going so, right so rough and steep and and the more time the dogs spend in there back and forth and around and you know as time goes by and they're they're in there in that mess it makes it harder and harder and harder to get out of it okay so i've heard backtracking now for the seven six or seven times I've, I've come out and done this with, with you guys are you talking about the dogs running the cat in the wrong direction following its tracks in the wrong direction <clears throat> excuse me or the cat like coming into somewhere spinning around and going out on the same set of tracks so that wouldn't necessarily be backtracking if it if it came in and went out on its same track then they're following it the right way but if, right so if they're if you're physically looking at a track and it's pointed north and your dogs are headed south that's backtracking. that's yeah. backtracking so my initial thought when i first heard backtracking was uh the cat coming back on no, its own double and yeah we'd, we'd say that double back on itself or in a, in a cat and they do do that right yeah they do do that but what I sorry, what I was talking about is is uh, whatever animal we're trying to catch is travel in a certain direction, and we're going the opposite direction. Right. That's yeah. what we, James yeah. and I. The buddy, odds were just, of catching that cat are, are significantly <laughs> significantly <laughs> yes. reduced. Unless it makes a big circle back on itself, you're probably not going to catch them going backwards. Right. Right. Uh, so my thought was backtracking was the cat or whatever you're pursuing following its own trail out no. of somewhere and they do do that and that can be difficult for dogs to figure out uh but that really wouldn't be exactly what that's we we would i would commonly refer to that as double and back yeah yeah sure you know if that makes sense it does absolutely yeah, yeah. No, that's yep. a good question no absolutely so uh and and double and back would be 
can be really tricky for dogs. I know um, the the cat we did catch, Tracy, I, I watched the video and it doubled back on his tray. went and yes. made a loop at a tree where I thought maybe it was going to tree. And I, we actually walked in there looking because I thought them rotten scoundrels, beep, beep. <laughs> scoundrels, flea bugs. They, uh, they had it and, and they, you know, trailed out on their own track. Well, after a couple hours later and the dog's going back again to that spot and watching where they did, you know, we, we weren't efficient at catching that cat. We did catch it, but it wasn't efficient and it wasn't, you know, the dogs had to work about three times as hard to do it, but it had backtracked and then it peeled off about 150 yards from where it had doubled back, doubled back. Yeah. Yes. Not backtracked. See, that's so, where I was. Yeah, that's see? Yep. It doubled back on it for 150 yards and, and my dogs kept going on the backtrack. Or or the double back, but and then they went to it. So they went from the double back to the backtrack, and right. then they would try to do the backtrack. So, so there was a lot of double back backtrack in one race, right? And that was um, interesting. And and I tell you what, I don't know about you or James, but that's a real um, point of anxiety when when the dogs do that for me because I'm like. You think they're screwed up, yeah. but you don't know for certain if they're screwed up. <clears throat> Especially if it's a clean turnaround. You know what I mean? If it's that clean, it's like, you're, cause mentally you're like, is that a tree right there? Or did that thing really go back there? And is the longer it stays on the track, I start breathing when it leaves the track. That's when, that's when I go like, okay, we're still good. I and I don't, I, you know, you, you hunt bobcats a lot more than I hunt bobcats. And with lions, you don't necessarily, I feel like, see that as often as you do with bobcats um not to say that it doesn't happen because it most definitely does but chasing bobcats all the time i think you see that a lot more than you do yeah. just you know running and folks and more on lions and i don't think it's really widespread but I, I i do know there's several times that i've held my breath thinking what in the hell's going on and then when i watch it peel off and keep the same steam you know what i mean i'm like Oh yeah, it's a, it's still a jumped race, you know. Yeah. And you know, because at that point, it's normally a jumped race. You know, when they, well, I guess that's not always the case. No, I, you know, it's not uncommon to, you know, trail a lion out a ridge or out a bluff line for a half a mile, turn around and rock right back, and then turn off at a right angle. And I think that they just do that in their everyday life. They do it when they're jumped too, but they just do that in their travel. So if if it if a lion's trailing out a a, a ridge, yep. And how far do you think it goes before Well, it I'll tell around? you what, as we talked about this, I can tell you a few years ago I had one that was uh, about five years ago that uh, I was needing to catch up with pretty bad, and it was real hot outside. And uh, we got this track going early in the morning, and it was real dry country. And, and uh, they jumped that lion, and, and uh, I was within earshot of them when they jumped it. And I heard them go around a big bluffy point into a real rough mahogany kind of a canyon. And by the time I had rimmed out, those dogs, it it was hot. I mean, at daylight, it was 70, you know, so it was going to be a really hot day. And uh, those dogs had run off in there, and I, and, and again, this is a Garmin thing. Well, I mean, the dogs figured, but this is, but I could confirm it with this. I've maybe I've told you this story, but those dogs were 792 yards in front of me when I got up there, and they were all scattered out in a big lose. And boy, it was, I mean, it, this is tough country too, not, just rocks and grass and no no trees hardly at all. A few mahoganies and stuff, a juniper here and there. But anyway, uh, one of my old dogs. It, I mean, seven or ninety two yards, pretty good poke. And I'm standing on this point. I hopped off my my saddle mule and I was standing there looking at my Garmin. And they were all searching. They were in a big lose. And I thought, boy, if this doesn't get figured out in the next couple minutes, I'm in big trouble because this is. And it was something I needed to get done. And all of a sudden, Rex, my old black dog that's out here crippled now, here he come looking on the garment. Here he comes down that back track, not saying a peep, right the way he just went in there. And, I mean, that dog is hauling the mail. I mean, he is flying, and he ain't barking. And I'm thinking, what on earth? And I'm standing on this big point that's probably 30 feet tall, and there's a big rock slide off to my right, and it's full of mahoganies and dead juniper trees and stuff. And that dog came all the way, so 792 yards, came right back past me, went about another 50 yards, and hung a left and went south off that mountain, barking every breath. Really? And so went down there and caught that line. Those other dogs would have never caught that thing. 
but he figured that out. That's the furthest I've had one. But I know what you're – because I was thinking exactly what – I was like, are you kidding me? We literally just ran this thing through here. But you know what? Again, I, I – I, you know, I didn't overreact to that. I just was like, whatever. And he, and so that's another thing. And that, that's just something that sometimes our canine friends make us look really good and do stuff like that. But he sure did that day. Cause like, I literally could, that, like the next dog was four minutes behind him. Really? Oh, he'd had it caught for a while. You know, he, he went down there and he actually baited in a big, on top of a big boulder. And so that uh, that wasn't jump. That was just that lion trailing down there, no, eight hundred yeah, yards. That lion, that lion had got jumped under that rim mm-hmm. and ran all the way out there, and then turned around and went right back on his track, and then off. So it would have been shaped like a, a exact hairpin with a ninety. Yeah. But the ninety was seven hundred ninety-two yards plus fifty, so eight eight hundred and forty-two yards really? back its track before it turned off and went. That's a long ways. You know, 50 yards or whatever, you know, they might get lucky. But, boy, that far, that dog was using his brain to. Yeah, well, we had that collared line do that exact same when you were there, buddy. That line we had collared that the dogs overrun it, made yeah. a hard 90. Yeah. And it come back on that hard 90 and went right back in the way that it had come. And, you know, like we talked about, if you didn't have a collar on that cat, you'd have been really confused as to what the hell was going on. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, that same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. I had one there in kind of that real similar country to that. There's one tree, and game one I was with kind of joked it. We'd caught it in the only tree in the county. and uh, <laughs> He's not joking. There's yeah, no trees over there. But he'd been there, and so uh, it had killed <laughs> it, it had killed I was, a calf. Hold on. I'm, well, you, don't, don't forget your story, John. I, we meet, I take the kids over to James to go hunting with the kids you know and and the first thing i am I, i'm like where do you hang a deer <laughs> if we got to skin a deer i'm like how do you guys skin deer like yeah, there's nothing here <laughs> he's gotta go to his garage i mean you can't just like pull up in a tree anyways i i just dropped a chip it go yeah ahead. so it this line had killed a calf uh the day before actually and i think i was out of town or it it had been for whatever reason 24 hours after the fact and the rancher had actually seen the lion drag calf across the road. And uh, so he calls the next day. Game warden calls the next day. It's about 8 in the morning, and it's already getting warm out. It's June. Um, and he says, you think we can catch this cat? And I'm like, well, we can try. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, you know, maybe. It's going to be tough. Yeah. And so I I run home, grab dogs, and run down there and meet the rancher and he says, yeah, the calf's right down here in this little bit of a draw. And uh, so I go down there, and I can't find I mean, there's no dead calf anywhere in this. And I walk back out, and I I ask the rancher, I'm like, are you sure that that this is where it was at? And he says, you see that pile of grass right there? And he, he'd he gone down there and pulled his ear tag out of the calf. He's like, I got the ear tag right here in my truck. It drug it right through here, and, I mean, it was I could see it from the road. And so I'm like, well, all we can do now is just turn dogs out and let them kind of free cast up this hillside and see what happens. And so we do that and they leave and don't say a word and, but they're going and they take off and make, we could watch the whole race. They make this just huge giant loop and three quarters of the way through it still haven't said a word. And we're standing on the edge of this, this little draw uh with the only tree in the county and uh kind of like a dry creek bed and dogs start coming back and they're lined out right at us at this point in time and we've been standing there for an hour watching this and uh they start opening and they're 200 yards away from us and they're making some noise and game warden looks at me and goes your dogs are running back to us i look I'm like no they're they're not running back to us well, sure enough, I mean, they come right by us 100 miles an hour. You could have reached out and caught one of them, um, making all sorts of racket. They go 50 yards past where we're standing, throw on the brakes, spin around, and they got it bait up in a sagebrush patch right there. And it, it squirts out of that and luckily climbed that one tree that was there. But we'd stood there for an hour within, you know, 50, 75 yards of this cat, and it was just laid up in the brush. We had no idea it was even there. 
Um, and he was, you know, if he'd gone a little bit further, he'd have been right back in there on his own track, uh, from where he started. So he just didn't have time to get there. Well, we just about wrap up. I got that one more question. Do you think cats know what tree they want to climb? And when do you think they, they pick it? Cause I've seen bobcats and maybe my dogs just suck. And so they got, you know, they're, they're not pressured good enough, but. Like like in reprod, you know, uh, you know, timber ground, repro- it'll be one big tree. A lot of times, like I'll catch that bobcat in that big tree, big, big. I think it bird. depends on how much pressure you're putting on them. Because I've then, seen, ouch, you know, <laughs> appreciate. I, that's why I got good friends. I've seen, man. <laughs> I've seen great big lions in tiny little trees get up there, and I've even had them, you know, in a tree that's too small for them to the point where they fall out and and hit the ground and then they have to find another tree because they fall out (laughs) that that tree was not a good choice um and so i i really think that i think in their mind they probably have an idea of Mm -hmm. this is going to be a safe tree but i think it really depends on how much pressure you're putting on them when you know you do catch those big big cats i just see a lot of bobcats hit trees that are mistletoed out in the top and brushy and Giant. Just the bigger ones, yeah. yeah. Like, like, and I just notice it. Like, I'll be, you can be running one. I'll be like, "There's the tree. It's going to end up in." You know what I mean? Really? And, yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity. I know James has too to, to watch over the years, quite a number of lions tree quite a ways in front of the dogs, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to watch them do that. Like, like I distinctly remember two years ago one. We were trailing one in a big rough creek drainage with uh, big high bluffs and lots of rock slides. And the dogs had trailed down across this drainage. And uh, I hadn't crossed the drainage yet. And I heard the the tempo of that track pick up. And I thought, you know, they're going to jump that thing. And so I stayed on the side I was on. And, and uh, the dogs went out of sight in a big uh, flat juniper mahogany patch up on this, this plateau. And uh, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. I was looking ahead kind of where they're at. And I thought it was Simmer, my red dog. And I look at it, it was the lion. And uh, that lion was going right back the way they'd just come in. It it had went right through all the dogs. So the dogs are all south, actually. And this lion was going back to the north. That lion ran right back down its track, maybe two, three hundred yards, down over the side of the rim. And there's a big leaning kind of a cow shade Doug fir tree there on a little bitty north slope. And that lion ran right up to the base of that and looked around, looked back where those dogs were, and then just walked up it real slow. So I, you're probably right, but like James said, though, I, I mean, I've actually had my dogs tree them in sage bushes. Yeah. And, and, you know, at that point, they're just like, I don't have anywhere else yeah. to go, you I, know. And I think yeah. that is a, a absolute time that happens. But, you know, li, li, you, leaners for, for lions, you see a lot of leaners? Quite a few, yeah. yeah. Um, Are growing out of the, you know, growing right out of the side of a rock cliff, kind of yes. leaning out. That's and, where they like to, you know. The the and again I think that you know what's funny James I was going to ask you but like I'll have my dogs I'll be hunting in places where there is quite a few trees uh, but still bluffy and rock slides and I've I've bayed in holes and caught on bluffs a number of lions where there's multitudes of good trees for them to tree in but yet they and still they choose to not to, yeah. to not climb up a tree like in some of this country like you and I were talking about they they literally don't have an option there's rocks or grass you and know, i've so. seen him even um one that i distinctly remember where we were running that cat through a bunch of just lodgepole slash and blow down and uh that lion jumped up on a slash pile and was kind of on a bunch of tipped over leaning lodgepole trees and his ass was right up against a perfectly good tree to climb and for whatever reason that cat stood right there on that log and you know we had probably seven eight nine dogs on the ground and it looked up that tree once like it was going to climb and then it decided nope and it it came right off right down into the middle of that dogs and uh that started a train wreck from one side of that hillside to the other and that slash and we had bleeding dogs tied out across the whole hill and finally after about the fourth time it got up on a slash pile and came out of it we caught it and i guess i mean you could call it a tree but it was mostly just a blow down mess and he stayed put for long enough to we actually darted that cat but um you know for whatever reason he he didn't want to climb and there was nothing wrong with him as far as you know broken foot or anything like that he just 
he decided he wasn't going to climb. James, when that happens, do you think that thing's had an experience where it's been caught before or whatever? Do you think it just, just doesn't feel like climbing a tree? You know, in, in that instance, in the area that we were at, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that cat had been run pretty hard before. Um, but also in that area, there it's a pretty dense wolf population in there. And I think that, and, you know, I don't have any science behind this, but I really do think that those wolves start pressuring those lions and coming in on a kill and coming in on a kill. And that line gets to a point where it decides, okay, I'm done taking this. And, you know, I've been chased by wolves enough times. Or part of me thinks, and whether or not this is true or not, um, you know, that lion gets pushed and pushed and pushed by wolves and then finally gets a single wolf that's pushed it to that point. And one-on-one, -on -one, I think that lion kills that wolf. Mm -hmm. And so I think they do that a couple times. And, you know, I went from, I, I used to be totally comfortable running one or two dogs on a lion. And, you know, after having a couple killed and everything else, I mean, now I want four or five, ten, you yes. know, however many dogs you can get in there. Yeah, um, I think they're safer. And and I do think that what I've seen, I guess, is our as our wolf numbers have gotten higher, we've had more problems with cats on the ground um, than I ever did before. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had that yet here. I'm sure we're headed there. Uh, but that's an interesting, that's why I ask, because it's like, I always wonder, you know, it seems like they're pretty good at climbing trees, and then you have one where there's all kinds of good trees, but yet they choose to not yeah, climb yeah. up in a tree. And I guess it's no different than, you know, walking a bear down a creek all day long and perfectly good timber, you know. I, I haven't bear hunted yeah. in a long time, but I guess real similar. For whatever reason, they just decide they're not going to go up. They just pass a bunch of good trees. I'm like, well, I didn't like that tree. Yeah. Maybe it's not the right one. One thing I've noticed about the trees and cats is they're really hard to see up there. Yeah. Bobcats, for sure. Yeah. Um, especially in the area you guys are in. It's crazy. I can't, I, I would have never imagined that. Yeah. I, I mean, the only experience I have of, of that is, you know, on television and they're always in, you know, wide open trees and it's on television. Oh yeah. But here I, we are in the snow laying on our backs with binoculars, looking up at these trees, <laughs> trying to find, I've had them. Like, uh, oh my goodness. One that I, I really remember, we caught a bobcat one day and I mean, knew for certain that the cat was in this tree and I had a buddy that even he climbed the tree as high as he could get up into this kind of big section of mistletoe and climbed all the way up there and we couldn't find this cat. And uh finally it's like, well, he's he's not in here, whatever, you know, we're gonna have to go back to the truck. We walk all the way back to the truck, we're coming off the mountain. The other buddy I with I that was with us stops, slams on the brakes, says we're going back. We turn around, we walk back in there to that tree and Sure enough, there's an out track coming out of that tree, and that <laughs> that cat had been in the tree, uh, and and we couldn't find it, and we went back and and ran it again out of that out track out of that tree. But yeah, like you say, sometimes those bobcats can get, get into places you don't have really that problem with lions, but um, those bobcats can surely get into some places. It's almost like they lay totally flat and they, and don't move. They are difficult, and it's the hard part is is. When you're a guy like me, we I don't know who's we we're joking with Phil or Nate on one of the podcasts that I don't trust the dogs enough, you know, yeah. so I won't pet a dog until I confirm that it's good. I mean, that's just, I, the two things I don't do is, uh, I, I, I've gotten away from encouraging a tree. So it's like Andy, you, you know what I mean? I, if she's not going to tree on her own, I don't, I don't mess with it right now. I like, but when she does tree, I'll encourage that, you know what I mean? But I'm, I'm. I've had my days of trying to hold a pup up to look at a cat in a tree, and I'm like, yeah, that just don't work. You know what I mean? Either they got it or they don't, and 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 I I'd rather not teach them because in those situations, if I walk you know walk down somewhere and there's not a cat there, that's really frustrating. So that's the hard part is you're sitting there looking because you really want to confirm it for the dogs. I mean that's that's how we count. You know what I mean? We don't if if, if I can't see it, then I don't count it as hey we caught it. I I just don't know. But um, that's difficult. So, all right, we uh, anybody got a good train wreck story? John probably does. I'm I sure. I have all kinds. All right, which one do you want? <laughs> Look, give okay, us... we were just talking about tree things. I'll tell you a good not tree thing. <laughs> uh, 
I, I have so many of these. I mean, I literally, I could write a book about these. Uh, one of my mentors said, he said, you know how you, uh, uh, we were talking about lion hunting because that's kind of what he does anyway. And he said, uh, you know, there's like 10,000 different ways that you don't catch a lion. And I'm like, kind of looked at him funny. And he goes, well, no, he goes, what happens when you catch a lion? And I'm, and I didn't understand exactly the question. I'm like, and he goes, well, you know, you go out and you start a track and, you know, you find it and you're the right way and they trail it and, and you know, you jump it and maybe it runs far or maybe it doesn't, but then you just catch it, right? And I was like, well, yeah, I guess that's probably about right. And he goes, but there is 10,000 different ways. But he's been with me at least on one occasion with it's like, you Chase, he's, Chase, he's been with yeah, me. Yeah, you don't catch them. But anyway, so back to the tree thing. So uh, I hit a track. This has been a long time ago. I mean, a long couple decades ago, but I still remember it like it happened this morning. So obviously it put a bark in my brain. But anyway, the uh, <clears throat> dogs hit a lion track, and, and uh, I was up on top of a big high mountain, and where they went off was really rough, so I had to go around. And Anyway, they trailed a long, long ways, and I get down there, and, and uh, <clears throat> I hear the dogs off there barking bait in a big bluff line. And uh, I thought, oh, man, so... Anyway, I, I get toodling down there and I get closer and closer and man, I, I can't see a lion, but I'm like, well, it could be off in a crack or whatever. And, uh, those, what had happened, I, I figured, I figured it out later, but that lion had hunted down that bluff line. And I'm not afraid to tell you this, this will make you laugh, but so Tom lions in this country, uh, and I don't know James about for your way, but they, <clears throat> most lions in this country, absolutely positively will not walk by a skunk without killing it. They, they absolutely love them. Uh, and and those dogs, and I had like 12, are bait in this hole, in a pretty good-sized hole. And uh, anyway, to make a long story as short as I can, I got in there, and as I get down there, I'm like, man, that kind of stinks here. <laughs> and uh, that lion had got in there and tried to get that skunk. And when those dogs got there, and I, of course, I had my normal load of some puppies. I'm not making any excuse for them. But anyway, so uh, I had a big old Tom skunk bait up. Actually, they couldn't even touch it. It was way back in this hole. So anyway, I was super frustrated. And I called my mentor, one of my mentors that night, and told him about that. And he said, hey, he said, well, you're trailing a lion, right? And I said, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, I found its track and, you know, all that stuff. And they said, well, you ever seen where lions eat a skunk? And I go, oh, yeah, about a thousand of them. And they said, you know what? That lion probably tried to get that skunk, and and then it went on, and those dogs found it, and that was that. But then, of course, <laughs> I was mad and kind of had to reprimand them for that, and then they were all had skunk in their face, and it was in the summer, so that was kind of the end of that deal. But anyway, so there's my train wreck for today. <laughs> Even get skunked. Yep. I did get skunked. Actually, I got skunked hard that day. <laughs> Don't you just love that when you start with the, the smell of a skunk is something you'll never Oh, I mean, yeah. You just never forget. Never forget. No, never. <coughs> Neither did they. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs>